budgets are everywhere, and no software company could survive for long without keeping a careful eye on them. As a game developer, the most critical one you'll come up against will be your processing budget. To render your masterpiece to the screen, you'll need to have a new one ready every 33 milliseconds if you're shooting for 30 frames per second, every 16 milliseconds for 60 frames per second, and only 8 milliseconds for 120 FPS. And these aren't just the GPU draw calls you need to account for getting user input, background resource streaming, running AI scripting and routines, performing any manual animation calculations required, culling geometry, and dozens of other tasks. That's the reason running more tasks in parallel is so beneficial. Once done and your 16 milliseconds are up, it's time to present your frame buffer for all the world to see. Then you start over. To avoid having your dream graphics become a slideshow, you'll need every trick in the book. A new powerful tool in your belt that's a part of DirectX 12 Ultimate is VRS, or Variable Rate Shading. That's right, the same DX12 Ultimate that's on Xbox Series X, S, and PC. How can this technology speed up your rendering on these platforms? Let's find out. Now, first things first, VRS is not VRR. VRR, or Variable Refresh Rate, has to do with being able to sync your frame buffer to the screen as soon as it's ready, instead of waiting for the sync to come around. So we'll begin our discussion of VRS by having an overly simplified look at a draw sequence, just to make a point. Now, suppose your art department is off for the week, and you're drawing a scene that has an unlikely solid blue sky as its background. A simple texture in front of that, and finally your main character. Gabe Diaz of Gears Tactics fame. And as you run all of these assets through your rendering pipeline, the pixels in the quote-unquote sky and our stalwart hero are both rasterized with the same resolution. One rasterized pixel equals one displayed pixel. But is that really necessary? You see, the sky in the background is, in our case, a large blue block and doesn't really have to be rendered one-to-one -to, -one to maintain fidelity. I mean, it's just a big blue block. It would look exactly the same if you rendered one screen-sized blue pixel or every fourth pixel. And why would we want to do that? Well, always keep in the back of your mind that fewer pixels means less rasterization time. Now, what if we could render Mr. Diaz at one-to-one -one fidelity, but the blue sky at 4x4 four four or 1 16th resolution? theoretically 16 times faster. Well, with variable rate shading, you can. While traditional rendering processes the entire scene at a 1x1 one one shading rate, VRS allows you to specify the rendering fidelity in three different ways. There is per draw, which is kind of the traditional each time you call to make something show up on the screen, you can specify the shading rate. There is per primitive, so like if you have a series of primitives, typically triangles, you can have a different shading rate for each one of them. And then there's my favorite, which is based on screen space image. This lets you specify to the engine a screen space image that determines what shading rate should be used in different parts of the screen. And there are some really spiffy things you can do with that. You can apply an edge filter to a screen space image to identify areas that require higher fidelity while leaving other parts of the image have slightly less definition. So here's an example from Firaxis Games. Notice how in the red areas where edges were detected, they render at a sharp one-to-one -one resolution, just like normal. But by contrast, in the blue areas where murky and relatively featureless water abounds, they can get away with a lesser definition of a 2x2 shader rate. Another popular use of a screen space image to regulate VRS rays is foveated rendering. And this is actually a very hot topic in the VR world these days. In devices that support eye tracking, foveated rendering allows only the parts of the HMD image that you're quote unquote looking at to be rendered in full detail. But by contrast, content on the periphery of your vision can be slightly less defined. And believe me, VR rendering performance needs all the help it can get. And even in Pancake Land, FPSs can use foveated rendering to allow slightly less detail around the edges of the screen while detail around your reticle remains pristine. 
Remember how fewer pixels equals more performance, and more performance in FPSs is always a good thing. But let's look at a real-world case study. Gears Tactics is one of my favorite recent tactical titles. And coincidentally, the very first game to ship with support for DirectX 12's variable rate shading. Using it on a wide range of hardware and with minimal impact on visual quality, developers from the initiative and disbelief managed a performance increase of up to 19%. I'll leave a link below to an excellent blog post discussing their iterative integration at length, but for our purposes, let's take a look at the most pressing question. How do you judiciously apply VRS without ruining your image quality? Well, in addition to figuring out which lighting passes could be calculated at a lower rate, they applied it to these specific areas. Number one, very tiny objects or things that are really far away that could be sampled at a lower rate with little to no impact. Two, depth of field masking. See, in Gears Tactics, in cutscenes, the renderer calculates the mesh distance to apply a depth of field effect. You know, the things either very close to the camera or very far away can be blurred. But why render something at full resolution when you'll be applying a lossy blur filter to it anyway? Number three, fog of war masking. Similarly, items that are obscured by their fog of war don't need to be rendered at the sharpest resolution, as most of that detail will be lost in post-processing anyway. Number four, in a similar vein, objects with heavy motion blur applied and meshes behind heavy particle effects like smoke and haze can also benefit greatly. It takes an iterative approach to find the right balance between visual fidelity and rendering time, but the trade-off is always worth it. Let's have a look at their cumulative savings. In regular usage, they save 2.4 milliseconds per frame during gameplay, and 2.6 milliseconds in cutscenes where depth of field allows those further savings we talked about. With more aggressive shading rates, they saved 4.4 milliseconds during gameplay and a whopping 4.7 milliseconds in cutscenes. And you can well imagine that if your render budget is only 16 milliseconds, what a huge difference that makes. So now let's bring things full circle back to our initial example and think about how we could apply these ideas to our scene. Let's start with the sky here. A simple 4x4 shading rate will give us the same blue block with no loss of fidelity and only 1 16th of the cost. And the more sky you have on your scene, the greater the cumulative savings. Now let's go up another level and look at our cityscape background. It certainly has more detail than a big blue empty sky, but isn't necessarily going to be the focus of our attention. We could sample that at a lower rate, say just 2x2. Two two. Okay, that's not too bad, but let's throw in a bit of depth of field and see how that looks. Pretty good, I'd say. And at theoretically one quarter of the rasterization cost, no less. As Socrates once said, Bilinear texture filtering covers all kinds of sins. Finally, at the front of our scene, we have Gabe Diaz himself. Let's leave him at the default 1x1 one one shading rate. Hey, that all looks pretty good. And if I do a rough estimate on the back of a napkin, I'd guess this part of the pipeline would run about, well, 23-24% to 24 faster. Not bad at all when every millisecond counts. I mean, again, we've done a pretty high-level walkthrough of variable rate shading, and hopefully I've given you a good idea of what it is and why you'd want to use it. Spend a few minutes later thinking about some unique ways that this could be used or combined with other technologies, and what impact this will have on the future of the Series X and S, PC, and other platforms. Here's an example. Think about DRS, or Dynamic Resolution Scaling. We're all familiar with that. In order to keep up with a very fast frame rate, Sometimes the rendering engine will lower the screen resolution and upscale the final image. The Doom games are pretty famous for scaling on the horizontal axis to keep the frame rate up. But what if we had instead a hierarchy where individual features, such as the skybox, could be dynamically rendered at a lower shading rate while leaving the other assets the same? Think about how Direct ML could be used to enhance the renders done at a lower shading rate for certain features instead of just blurring them. So that's a very brief high-level explanation of variable rate shading. What impact do you think that this will have on the Xbox Series X, S, the PC, and the future of game performance? Please leave a comment below and let us know.
Also, feel free to add any questions or suggestions you might have. And if you enjoyed this video and would be interested in seeing more, please consider liking it, subscribing, and hitting the notification bell. It would be greatly appreciated and really helps out a lot. Thanks for watching.